Did you read the New York Times? Yes. The New York Observer? Yes. Washington Post? Yes. Wall Street Journal? Of course I read it. Did you read that steampunk article in Boingway? I did not like the end of it. Hey everybody, it's Mark Brownfeller from Boing Boing. I'm here with Shani Chardin. She is my co-editor at Boing Boing. And today we're really excited because we have a special guest. She's Carrie Brownstein and she is the co-creator of the show Portlandia, which she also writes and co-stars in. She does a lot of other things too and we're going to talk about all of that stuff today. How's it going, Carrie? Good, how are you guys? Doing awesome. really well. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thanks for coming down. You're, you're here in LA with us at Meltdown Comics, which yes. is like a very cool place. Portland also, I, it just reminded me that Portland's got like uh, Powell's books, which is... Yes, it's under construction right now because of a leaky roof. Oh man. Which is not good for a bookstore. Or no. probably any store. I can't think of any store that's like, oh, we're so lucky we have this leaky roof. A mold thing. store. Yeah, very moldy. So they're redoing it. But I was just there and I, I go into Powell's a lot. Yeah. yeah, it's like, I, I actually, I've been there a bunch of times and it's like a place that I, I actually have dreams about a few times a year because oh, really? it's just, it's like, it's almost like a dream though. It's multi-dimensional oh, and kind of hidden of rooms. Labyrinthine and, quality, yeah. yeah, where you can get lost in there, which I think is a good trait for a bookstore. And you, this store is kind of like that too, where you could find a little corner and hang out in and yeah. just spend the day there. Yeah, we play Dungeons and Dragons here. We have like mm -hmm. a, a dads and daughters game That's on awesome. Saturday. It's really fun. Uh, Carrie. Portlandia is now in its fourth episode, and you've actually season. season. Oh my God! Okay. No, it's fine. Yeah, um, and you've actually uh, signed up for a fifth season mm -hmm. too. So um, the thing that I, I think is interesting, I, I typed Portlandia into Google, mm -hmm. and as I was typing in Portland, Portlandia shows up before Portland now. Oh, no, don't in tell Google. the city that. It's true, and so you are like massively successful now. How has that changed? The, do, you, do you feel a, a sense of responsibility of portraying Portland and the people of Portland differently than you did at the beginning? Not really. I think the show is very kind-hearted, so I think what we're portraying is, is you know, we're, people are not targets and the city's not a target. If anything, it's this beautiful background for our show, which is more about, you know, people's relationship to the places that they live in, you know, and that can be sort of the more figurative version of place or the literal version and they're either in concert with it or in conflict with it and Portland is just a good stand-in for so many cities that we love or places that we aspire to be in or have traveled to so yeah I think you know we're not making a documentary and um, I think if we just kind of treat the city as this character who we are both you know sort of in love with but befuddled by then you know, we're, we're doing justice to it. Um, yeah. And we shoot under the auspices of the city. I mean, we're in people's homes and in their businesses. So of course we are conscious of, at least from a, just a generosity perspective of, of doing good by the city. Yeah, and it helps that you actually live there. It does help that, <laughs> <laughs> yes. It helps, and um, yeah, I, you know, I've, I grew up in the Pacific Northwest and I feel such a kinship with that landscape. And yeah, it's hard for me to totally distance myself from it, even, especially psychologically. I, I leave there a lot, but I always feel like it's home. Yeah. But one of the things that strikes me about the show and, and reminds me of, Mark, what you and Carla originally created with Boing Boing, is this idea that uh, it's all in the spirit of play. Mm -hmm. It's not mocking weirdness. It's mm -hmm. sort of um, playfully celebrating weirdness mm -hmm. with the idea that we're all in this together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree. I think that, you know, it, it is in the spirit of frivolity and, you know, I think the way we approach things is with, like, with the idea that we want to explore something, you know, and that we're taking the audience with us. And I think by having that kind of openness, it invites the audience in. You know, we're not, we're not sort of prescribing, you know, a, this lifestyle or also we're not defining it so intensely that people think, oh, okay, well, that's what it is and I feel outside of it. So people feel a real sense of ownership over the show, which we love and find very flattering. You know, when they dress up as our characters for Halloween or they tell us that they <laughs> incorporated certain phrases. And I, I like that sense of it being conversational and there, this being kind of a fluidity to the approach in terms of once it's out there in the world, it feels kind of malleable, actually. Yeah. What are some of your favorite characters that you've created for the fourth season? 
Well, with the fourth season, actually what we did was we kind of took the characters whom we're most fond of in general and just wrote for them. Because people always ask us, like, aren't you going to run out of material? And we thought, well, we'd like the show to actually be less concept-based, to make it be about the lives of these people. Because characters, I think, are what people are drawn to, less than ideas. Mm -hmm. So. Um, the characters that we love and that are, we're exploring more this season, Tony and Candace from the Feminist Bookstore. Uh, They're my favorites. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I love those guys. I can, <laughs> Fred and I always say that we could live as Tony and Candace. If we had to, if we had to just, you know, if we were suddenly locked into a character for the rest of our lives. Um, and Peter and Nance, and Nance's, uh, you know, they had the uh, bed and breakfast last year, and they went to the chicken farm the first year. Mm -hmm. And we explore a lot of those guys, and I like them as a couple. They're just. You know, they're very, it's almost like their bones are soft, you know, they're just this very like <laughs> cloying, syrupy couple, they kind of melt into each other and, um, I, you know, it's fun to kind of explore different versions of, of couplehood or personhood through the mm -hmm. show because we get to play so many different people. Yeah, the, uh, the pull out king episode yes. <laughs> was, was amazing, Thanks. you had like complete gender reversal yeah. in that one. Mm. And, and so you, you did some, some kind of after effects with the voice, so you, they dropped your pitch. Yes. But it's you talking, obviously. But yes, they just it is me talking. And because the show is highly improvised, especially dialogue-wise, there is sometimes overlap. But with that character, because the editors need to have that voice be clean of other voices, you know, we tell the other actors, um, OK, we have to give it some space, mm -hmm. which is normally how a show is, that people aren't <laughs> just talking over each other. But sometimes with improv, you know, you the, Sometimes the better you get at it, the more you're not, but there's always a little bit of overlap. So it's the one mm -hmm. time that we have to be very kind of technical in terms of the scene. Um, and I have a hard time watching Lance, but I think that we, now that we've made him a more fully realized character, I actually have a less difficult time. When he was just this guy with a safe word, mm -hmm. cacao, and this strange <laughs> relationship with his girlfriend, I didn't know what to do with that. Uh -huh. <laughs> but now that I, you know, I see him in uh, more multidimensional terms, and I think there is a slight sensitivity to him and a, definitely a weirdness. Mm -hmm. But people really liked that episode, so I was yeah. happy about it. Yeah, the other thing I liked about the episode um, is that it had uh, Jello Biafra in it. Yes. And, and so that in, in, in season three, mm -hmm. you did the Lucky Seven Punk House episode, yes. where you played a kind of a, a, someone giving a tour guide to some seniors, mm -hmm. checking out a, an authentic 1980s era punk house. Mm -hmm. And Fred. Was, was one of the like living national treasures <laughs> yes. of, of the house. And the second he opened his mouth, I'm like, he's, he's channeling Jello Biafra. Absolutely, he he's was. like, pitch perfect. He's mm -hmm. so good at it. Music, I suppose, yes. <laughs> the pop DJs stood at attention and the people just fed off of it. Yummy, can I have some more slop? How did you get Jello to be actually on the show? Did you send him the, the episode? And, no, I mean, we, you know, it's interesting. You're the first person to mention that Fred had already done like a pretty spot on impression of Jello. And originally, Fred was just going to play this, you know, 80s punk, you know, with that sort of strident, you know, philosophy and also just that wonderful way of speaking, mm -hmm. which um, is everything sort of elongated and nasally <laughs> and, you know. And then we thought, what if we just asked Jello Biafra to do it? Because mm -hmm. that's basically who he's, you know, yeah. conjuring anyway. And he said yes, you know. And I think that's the great thing about the show, and I think speaks to the fact that it is um, not mean spirited. Is that you know people get a chance to come on. They know they're not going to be made fun of, but it gives them a chance to showcase that most people are self-aware. Most people have a sense of humor about themselves. We always have musicians on the show, or you know, actors that are normally in more serious roles, and they get to come on and just be frivolous and kind of showcase a side of themselves that's a little different. And I mm -hmm. think Jello was game, and he took it very seriously. He came in the night before. He wanted to know his motivation. He was not interested in improvising <laughs> at all, actually. Wow. <laughs> yeah. You know, he he really wanted to make sure his acting chops were up to par, mm -hmm. and it was it was fun. It was a it was a great day with him. That's cool. Mm -hmm. And another example of that, like the mayor. Yes. Sam Adams. Yeah. He's on your show. He is. And now he's a former mayor. But at the time, you know, and obviously he's tasked with a lot of very serious, you know, civic issues and, and city planning and, you know, has the whole city, um, city's best interest in mind. But he was willing to <laughs> come on our show. And um, he's just, I feel like he's a very, he's a very modern man. He's a very contemporary kind of politician. I mean, mm -hmm. now you see Obama on Between Two Ferns. You know, there's just this way of, I think people want to be seen as multifaceted, you know, and not so disconnected from the populace. And, you know, not the entire American public watches Between Two Ferns, but there is, you know, it's 
there's a generation of people who's that's the way they get information. Mm -hmm. And I think Sam Adams has always been aware that Portland's a young minded city. And he was um, very interested in it. And we kept him on the show even after he, um, you know, went on and, you know, didn't run for a, another term. Because he'll always be the, the mayor in Portlandia. Yeah, well, he'll be the mayor's <laughs> assistant even. We didn't even give him the main job. I love he it. said, right. be the assistant. <laughs> yeah. That's great. You, you were talking about, like, how people are watching shows, like, Between Two Ferns on the internet and stuff. Um, one thing that I thought was interesting was I was reading about Portlandia. A lot of people watch it online, like mm -hmm. on IFC Channel or Netflix or Hulu. I mean, it's like almost half, I think. Yeah, that's, I would imagine. That's, that's crazy. Yeah. And, and then looking back, Portlandia really kind of, its roots are in, in something you did with Fred mm -hmm. as an internet, was it YouTube or just on the internet, uh, Thunder Ant? Yeah. T talk about like how you guys got started with that and, and where it led, how, how it became Portlandia. Well, it's such a wonderful progression that just stemmed from our friendship. So we just, you know, we were living on opposite sides of the country. We still do for the most part. We wanted to collaborate. And so we just started making these little videos. You know, we would, Fred would fly to Portland and we would get together the night before, just write down ideas. We really just wanted to sort of explore these uncomfortable moments. So mm -hmm. a lot of the early Thunder Ant sketches are so clumsy and awkward. I mean, it's just very, like, it's, we'll just keep going back to one thing and doing it over and over again. It's, I mean, it's, it's clunky and silly and more con conceptual than, mm -hmm. than funny. Um, and eventually we realized that we had developed kind of a sensibility, a p point of view that we were really talking about, the kinds of people that we were maybe becoming or sort of like exploring and what our friends were doing. And it just, you know, it seemed like, well, what if this was a show? You know, what if we became more intentional and deliberate and expanded it to something that seemed more pointed and had narrative arcs and, you know, so we pitched it and we brought in Jonathan Kreisel, who was uh, our director, and he just, he had the real strong aesthetic vision. He really wanted Portlandia, Portland to be a character. You know, he mm -hmm. wanted the city where it took place to feel like it was part of the show, that you couldn't just divorce the characters mm -hmm. from their setting. And, but it was a very natural process, and which is surprising, I think, with television, although it happens more and more, you know, that people are looking for shows that feel like they stem from a real friendship or a real dynamic, you know, like mm -hmm. the show Broad City or something that just feels um, earnest. Yeah. That's it, interesting. You were talking about the uh, characters. Do you see, all, all, you do so many different characters on the show, and they're obviously kind of extreme. Uh, they've, they've been pushed personality-wise. But do you kind of sometimes think that, like, that could have been me if I would have been like kind of nudged in that direction for the different characters. Absolutely, I feel like that's a really fascinating um, frame of mind to, or thread to go down. Is just you think like, what if I hadn't gone to this college? What if I'd gone to this other place? Or what if I hadn't gone to college or taken this job or dated this person? And you almost imagine like you can just see into the future of this other trajectory, like this mm -hmm. other self. And I, that's one of my favorite things about being these various people. It's like I put on a wig, even like aesthetically you think, I, you see someone else and you think, I could never, I would never be able to pull that off or I would never be able to have long hair or whatever it is, you know? And then all of a sudden here comes the wig and these outfits and I just look in the mirror and I think, oh yeah, it, it wouldn't have been that hard. I mean, <laughs> apparently it's easy to be all these other people. And uh, yeah, so we love that. And I think it is an exploration of not just personalities but ways of connecting with people ways mm -hmm. of you know other ways that people relate to others or ha what their sense of self is and it's um, from a performer perspective it's it's just there's such a wealth of things to, to explore and yeah. yeah I love that a lot it's like if there's you, so much Carrie and Fred in each of the characters yeah. yeah but aspects of Carrie and Fred that Carrie and Fred may not know about yeah or that we dial down you know it's like the Kath and Dave, who are incensed over the dog being tied up, the A.O. River couple, you know. <laughs> I mean, they're just, I always think of them as like when you're like making popcorn and you just, you are watching it and you're like waiting for it to just finally <laughs> like pop. And they exist in that state of apprehension <laughs> and like hot heat the whole time, <laughs> you know. And, but I can get to that state, we all can, that state yeah. of agitation. You try to tone that down because you think this cannot be healthy, you know, like, but they thrive on it. They thrive on it, and um, so yeah, it, I feel like it is, you know, sort of 
focusing on aspects of her personality that you know you kind of have to keep in check if you're going to have friends. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you you actually do like a lot of stuff outside Portlandia. I can't believe how you accomplish so much. Um, you must be very busy. One thing, you're, are you writing a memoir? Yeah, and I'm almost done. Mm -hmm. um, yes, and that, that should be out next year. Mm -hmm. And it, it, will that be talking about, uh, like, is it going to focus on your, your music and, and Portlandia? Or? Yeah, m mostly music. I feel like that journey, and then at the end, it kind of veers into Portlandia a little mm -hmm. bit. And then the other thing is, I mean, you're a musician, and, and mm -hmm. uh, I think it, maybe it was Rolling Stone said you were like one of the top. 25 underrated women guitarists? I think just <laughs> guitarists. I think that oh, category. Okay, that's even better like, then. <laughs> yeah, it's even better. <laughs> so yeah, no, um, yeah, I play music. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. cool. And so what's what's going on? Are you are, are you doing stuff with Slater Kinney or, or no, Wild Flag? Ni neither, but I'm, I am working on some music. Mm -hmm. but Is it like a solo thing? Not quite. It's a collaboration, but yeah, that will be out. It's it's with some people that I've played with before mm -hmm. and some new people, and yeah, that will be out early next year. Okay, mm -hmm. so it's a secret until it's then. It's a secret until then, <laughs> okay. yeah. Carrie, it's been so cool having you it's come cool and talk to, be to here. you. Yeah. Big fan it's, of Boing Boing. Oh, thank you so much, yeah. and we're fans, and we love the fact that in the first episode, I think it might have been your first episode, first season, you mentioned Boing Boing. Absolutely. We'll so. try to mention it in every episode. Oh, <laughs> I love it. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds good. Yeah. Okay, well, thanks for having me on. Yeah, thanks a Thank lot. You too.